and thank you for joining us today on this beautiful day in central New York. Uh, my name is Torn Washington. I work in the College of Arts and Sciences Advancement and External Affairs Office, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Black Holes and Gravitational Waves Using Einstein's Legacy to Explore the Universe. Before we begin, we ask everyone to mute their microphones as this will ensure that everyone can hear our presenters clearly. We are recording this webinar, which we will make available via the college's communications platforms for those who would like to watch later. If you do not want your image recorded, please feel free to disable your video camera by clicking on the video camera icon in the lower left-hand corner of your Zoom feed. Please note that you can leave any questions you have in the chat and we will try to get to all of them during the Q&A section of this webinar. I would now like to turn it over to Paul Swartz, our moderator for today's Arts and Sciences Alumni Academy presentation. Paul? Thank you, Torn, and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Paul Swartz. Uh, I'm a SU alum from the class of 2005. I'm presently a senior economist at the Bruce Henderson Institute at the Boston Consulting Group. Now, if you're wondering why an economist has the honor of introducing these prodigious scholars, um, I, I would say, well, occasionally economists are accused of having physics envy. We are rarely accused of being good physicists. Um, but this is the beauty of the College of Arts and Sciences, um, where the talent extends from physics to economics to literature and beyond. Um, and I have the privilege um, of serving uh, the deans on the Dean's Advisory Board as a vice chair uh, for the past few years. And this gives me a, a um, a for, the fortunate opportunity to see many of the talents, um, including Professor Brown, that we have at the university. Now, not only is uh, the College of Arts and Sciences the largest and oldest college at Syracuse University, it's also the school where every student will take classes, making it uh, a unique source of common mission and the gravity for all Syracuse alums. Yet the college is more than that, being the driver of the university's research mission. And as you will see today, our science faculty are world-class thinkers and researchers who are committed to both graduate and undergraduate teaching and research. Right now, I'd like to give our presenters a quick introduction. Professor Douglas Brown uh, is the Charles Brightman Endowed Professor of Physics, is a leader in the field of gravitational wave astronomy and astrophysics. Professor Brown's contributions to, Li to LIGO's Nobel Prize winning data have helped open a new window into physics, astronomy, and cosmology while reframing fundamental questions about the origins and evolution of the universe. Recently, his team contributed to a major discovery, witnessing the co collision of two neutron stars in deep space and the resulting afterglow that signified the process of gold being created. He's the principal investigator of more than a dozen sponsored research projects and an accomplished teacher, mentor, and author. Professor Brown earned his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in 2004 and came to Syracuse in 2007. And in addition to Professor Brown, we'll be hearing from Laurel White, a senior majoring in physics and an undergraduate research assistant in SU's gravitational wave group. Laurel is finishing her honors thesis studying parameter estimation for gravitational wave signals from binary neutron star mergers. Um, additionally, we'll hear from Amber Lennon, a PhD candidate in the Department of Physics and graduate research assistant in SU's gravitational wave group. Amber currently works in the detection and measurement of eccentric gravitational waves in LIGO and the Cosmic Explorer. Amber received her BS in physics from Syracuse and her MS in physics from West Virginia University. Um, with that said, um, we're, we plan to, uh, after the presentation, we plan to do Q&A. Um, given the size of the group, we'd like to do this through the chat. Um, so feel free to enter questions as the presentation is going and I will do my best to moderate them at the end. Uh, with that said, I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Brown, Amber, and Laurel. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Professor Brown. Thank you for that introduction, Paul. So um, uh, let me get started. Hopefully everyone can uh, can see my, uh, my screen share. Um, what we're going to talk to you about today is, is a, a kind of astronomy that's been in development for over 100 years, but really has only come to fruition um, in the uh, in the last five years or so, and, and Syracuse University has played a, a leading role in, in established, establishing this this new field of astronomy. Um, so I'm going to tell you how we use gravitational waves to explore the universe and and learn about the nature of black holes and, and other compact objects. So let me begin by um, showing you how we've looked at the universe for pretty much all of all of human existence. So people have looked up at the stars for as 
long as people have been around and, and kind of wondered, you know, what are the stars made of? Where, where do they come from? Where are they going? You know, where do we come from? Where are we going? And this is a, a beautiful picture of stars taken in, in a, a very dense region of, of uh, the universe called a globular cluster, where there are a lot of stars close together, gravitationally bound. And you can see an awful lot from this picture. I mean, you can see there are many, many, many different stars. But one thing you can immediately see is not all the stars are the same color. We're used to the, the light from our sun, the white light that comes from our sun. And you can look at this picture and you can see here that some of these stars look reddish, some of these stars look white like our sun, and some of these stars are blue. And what that tells us, if we can understand the, the physics behind the way that stars work, so nuclear fusion, uh, black body radiation, the processes that drive these stars of gravity driving the, the, the fusion engine of these stars, we can understand that all these stars are in fact, different temperatures, different masses, and so they tell us about different types of stars that are out there in the universe. So we can learn a lot from looking at the universe in light, and that's how we've looked at the universe for, 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 for human history, really starting with Galileo's telescopes in earnest, you know, up to modern telescopes like, like the Hubble telescope that took this image. But there's another way to, uh, to study the universe rather than, just, uh, rather than just looking at light. And that begins with uh, the end of stars, when stars explode. So this is a picture of um, a star much like those blue stars. The blue stars in the last picture are the most massive stars. And when they exhaust their nuclear fuel, they explode in, in what's called a supernova explosion. Um, the supernova explosions that we see, this is a picture of a supernova taking in, in light and x-rays. These supernova explosions create some of the heavy elements that we see around us that, that, that make life on, uh, ultimately make life on Earth. And they leave behind what astrophysicists called stellar remnants, compact objects, the, the, ashes of the, 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 the ashes of the stars that are left behind. And two of the most interesting ones that these dead stars can leave behind are black holes, where there's so much material left behind that it collapses under its own gravity, and then an object called neutron stars, where a star that doesn't have quite as much material left behind in its, in its remnant core can produce uh, uh, the densest material that you can get in the universe um, before things collapse down to black holes, and these are called, these are called neutron stars. So I'll explain what these are in a, in a moment. But going back to um, uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, so how do we how do we study these these stellar explosions the and the and the products they leave behind? Well, the story started about a hundred years ago when Einstein wrote down um, the the general theory of relativity, which is a theory of how uh, uh, gravity behaves. And in Einstein's theory of general relativity, we picture gravity and its interaction with matter as being the curvature of space-time that we live in. In Newton's theory of gravity, gravity expressed as the force between two objects. But in Einstein's theory of gravity, we think of gravity as the curvature of space-time itself. So we don't just live in this, you know, Newtonian background where nothing particularly happens. We live in this dynamic space-time that we influence and that influences, influences us. And gravity is pictured in Einstein's theory of curvature of space. And this picture shows three objects, maybe three different stars of, of different sizes, giving you different amount of cur space-time curvature. Of course, you can't see space-time, it's space itself, you can't see it, but if you could visualize the curvature of space-time, this is what it would look like. You see a lot of curvature around the, the most massive object, and then less curvature around the, um, uh, the least massive object, with this object in the middle. Imagine putting a bowling ball on a trampoline, and you see the curvature of space-time. That's what we're looking at here. And this curvature of space-time um, influences objects by their motion. So you can imagine the Earth, if this was the Sun, the Earth would be feeling this curved space-time, and that's what causes the Earth to orbit around the Sun. Um, so that's in, in the Einstein picture, it's not the force on the Earth due to the Sun, it's the curvature of space-time that the Earth is seeing due to the Sun's gravity that makes the Earth orbit around the Sun. So this is how matter and gravity interact. Um, if you have enough material, and you get enough space-time curvature. If you have these, these cores of stars that are left behind, you get enough material built up in the cores of these stars after they explode and the, the cores collapse down, they can keep free falling under gravity and collapse and collapse and collapse down. And that's what a black hole is. So a black hole is, this is the space-time curvature of a black hole. Basically, this keeps going down forever. The space-time curvature just gets more and more and more and more uh, uh, curved, gets stronger and stronger curvature as you get towards the, the center of the black hole. 
where we don't really know what happens. Our knowledge of physics breaks down at the uh, um, where the uh, the curvature becomes singular at the uh, at the center of a black hole. But we think that these processes happen. We have good evidence that black holes exist, and now we have direct evidence that black holes exist. So the story of this field, really, if the field of gravitational waves is. Einstein wrote down his theory of general relativity and very rapidly predicted something called gravitational waves. Gravitational waves are what happens when massive objects move around each other. They create ripples in the fabric of space-time, like throwing a rock in a pond. But you don't just get these static pools of curvature, you get ripples of curvature propagating outwards. And he didn't believe his own calculations for a long time. He thought that this was just a, a mathematical artifact and these ripples weren't real. And he said, oh, well, these ripples are so tiny that even if they are real, they, they don't really matter. And there's a debate for 50 years about whether or not these ripples in space-time were, were a real physical effect or were just um, in the math of Einstein's equations. And it wasn't until the 1950s, a conference in, organized by uh, Josh Goldberg, who was a professor at Syracuse University, who passed away recently. Um, Josh, was an American, Josh was a professor here. He organized a conference that brought theorists together. And at that conference, people realized, no, these gravitations are real. They're a real physical effect. And at that meeting, um, Joe Weber, who was one of the pioneers of gravitational wave detection, Josh tells the story that you know he stood up, thumped his hand on the table, and said, "I'm going to build a gravitational wave detector." And he, he walked out and set about building a gravitational wave detector. And the process of doing that took the next 50 years of the field. So Weber's original experiments weren't sensitive enough to to detect gravitational waves, but they led to a new generation of of gravitational wave detectors that use lasers to detect gravitational waves. And this eventually culminated in, in 2015, when a couple of billion years ago, two black holes were orbiting around each other. So, so a couple of billion years ago in our universe, two black holes were orbiting around each other like this. And this is a computer simulation of what it might look like if you were close to these black holes. And you can see the, the curvature of space-time of these black holes bending the light of the stars behind them. That's where you can see the stars kind of swirling around behind them. And these, these black holes orbit each other, get closer and closer, and eventually merge and crash into each other and make a single black hole like this. And this sends ripples in space-time out. These ripples propagate through space. And this cartoon kind of shows the effect of these ripples in space-time on the Earth. You'll notice a scale vastly exaggerated here. As these gravitational waves go past, they cause space-time itself to stretch and squeeze. Of course, if the Earth was doing this at this scale, we would have noticed a long time ago. We wouldn't need to build gravitational wave detectors. We would have noticed the effect. But as these ripples from the black holes went past the Earth, they stretched and squeezed the Earth. To, um, and, and that physical effect can be detected by our, by our gravitational wave observatories. Now, gravitational wave observatories don't look like traditional telescopes. This is what they look like. This is the LIGO Hanford Observatory in, uh, in Washington State. And this is its partner observatory, a close-up look. This is the LIGO Livingston Observatory. You'll notice these big, long, four-kilometer, two-and-a-half-mile-long arms of the detector in the, in the picture here. Now, what they are is they are giant vacuum tunnels with a laser beam shining through them. Um, in the corner of the detector, there's a mirror that splits the laser beam and sends it to the end of the arms. And as the gravitational wave goes past, it causes the length of the arms to change, as you can see in this picture. And that causes the laser light to travel a different distance between the mirrors. So here comes uh, the laser light, the wave of the laser light coming down. It bounces off this mirror. And then you can see the laser light coming from the other arm. It recombines with the mirror. And if the arm lengths are perfectly balanced, then the laser light cancels out. The peaks and troughs of the, light, of the wave of light cancel out of the detector. But as the gravitational wave goes past and changes the relative arm length, you no longer get this cancellation of the light and you get light leaking out towards the, uh, um, the detector, and you can see a pattern of light. So the gravitational wave is encoded in that light signal on the, uh, that's received by the uh, a photodiode in the, in the detector. And that's how we actually measure these gravitational waves and use them to observe the universe. This is what the detector looks like for real. This is one of the end mirrors. Um, a lot of the effort goes into isolating these mirrors from ground motion, because anything that causes these mirrors to move around um, might fake a gravitational wave signal. These detectors are so sensitive, they can even see the atoms on the surface of the mirror jiggling around. So we have to make sure that we isolate the, uh, um, the detectors from as much noise as possible. And if we can do that, then we can search for ripples in the fabric of space-time due to these gravitational waves. 
And that's what was discovered on September 14th, 2000, uh, 2015. Um, this is the gravitational wave signal. This is not a simulation. This is real data. These are real observations from the, the LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livingston observatories that I just showed you pictures of. This is the signal of those two binary black holes crashing into one another. And if I play this and if you have sound on, Kind of hard to hear on computer speakers, but if you the sped up signal, you can hear a bit easier because it's higher frequency. But the whoop there you hear is the sound of the ripples in space time that these black holes cause when they crash into each other. So this was the first direct detection, the culmination of of, uh, of 100 years of effort in theory and experiment to build these gravitational wave detectors and detect these ripples in space time as they crashed into each other. And so this was the first discovery of the first direct observation of black holes and the first direct observations of the gravitational waves that they produce when they when they crash into each other. Um, and so, so this opened the field of gravitational wave astronomy, and now we can use the information encoded in these waves, just like when I showed you the picture of stars in the beginning of the talk, I said some stars are red and some are blue, and that tells us about the temperature. So the information encoded in the color of the light, the information encoded in the frequency of the gravitational waves tells us about the gravitational waves that we see. So these are two black holes. But I said stars don't just produce black holes when they die. Some stars produce something called neutron stars. And this is a picture of the Crab Pulsar in the, in the Crab Nebula. This was a star that went supernova um, about a thousand years ago and left behind this, uh, this object in the middle. This is the Pulsar. It's basically a city-sized atomic nucleus. You take an atomic nucleus, um, you take all the material in the star and you compress it down under gravity until you push the electrons into the protons and all the all the electrons and protons turn into neutrons and it gets packed together. So it's basically a an atomic nucleus that's about one and a half times the mass of the sun in an air in a in a ball that's about the size of Manhattan, that's about 12 kilometers across. And so this is incredible. This is the densest state of matter you can get in the universe before things collapse down to, to black holes. And these neutron stars are incredibly interesting because when they crash into each other, they, this is an artist's impression of what it looks like when two neutron stars crash into each other. So not two black holes crashing into, into each other, but two neutron stars crashing into each other. You don't just get the, the, the gravitational waves radiated, but you get a creation of a giant flash of light of two city-sized atomic nuclei smashing into each other at one third the speed of light. And that creates a flash of light and a burst of gravitational waves that we can, we can detect. And two years after the first discovery of um, gravitational waves from binary black holes, LIGO Hanford, LIGO Livingston, its partner observatory in Italy, Virgo, did it again and detected the crash of two neutron stars smashing into each other. And this is the gravitational wave signature that you get from two neutron stars crashing into each other. So this is a much longer signal. The neutron stars orbit around each other for much longer in the LIGO band before they crash into each other. And so as you, as you go along, you can see the track of the neutron stars. This is the time. And you can see this bright track of the gravitational waves against the, the noise in the uh, in the detector data. And so what you're hearing is the signal from LIGO. If I'm quiet, whoop, you can just hear it at the end. That's the whoop of these two neutron stars crashing into each other. So LIGO detected the um, uh, the, the gravitational waves from these detectors crashing into each other. You might say, well, why, do you, why did you build three gravitational wave observatories if they're all kind of seeing the same thing? Well, with three observatories, you can triangulate where on the sky those gravitational waves are coming from. And so by detecting this neutron star, the gravitational waves from this neutron star merger in Italy, in Louisiana, and in Washington state, we could figure out based on the timing information where on the sky these neutron stars were. And then gravitational waves are like a microphone that can listen to the universe and can hear all the different locations at the same time. The gravitational waves hear where it's coming from. You triangulate it, just like when you hear a sound and you, you look towards the sound. You can then tell people with very powerful telescopes to go point at the air on the sky where we think these two neutron stars crashed into each other. And you can look for the light produced when these two stars crash into each other. This is a great combination of, it's called multi-messenger astronomy is the buzzword. You use the gravitational waves to figure out something happened, where on the sky it happened, and then you tell people, telescopes to scan that region of the sky. The sky is a 
big place and telescopes can only see very small regions of the sky so you need the gravitational wave detection to say look there you go look there you take a picture of this galaxy you compare it against reference images and you find this thing right here that wasn't there the last time you took a picture of this galaxy this is the galaxy ngc 4993 um uh, a galaxy uh, outside the milky way um we had reference image of this galaxy you could, and then when people went back, this is again a Hubble Space Telescope picture of the galaxy. You see this bright point of light right here that isn't there in the older images. So this is a new um, optical source of of, uh, um, of, uh, of light in this galaxy that wasn't there in the reference images. And this is the light caused by those two neutron stars crashing into each other. So this is what it looks like. These are what the kind of raw, these are the, um, the Hubble Space Telescope is a, you know, our best instrument for optical astronomy. So it takes the most beautiful pictures. The actual pictures people looked at to discover this look like this. And you can watch the, uh, the source over a few days and you can see it fading away over the course of, uh, um, initially it's very bright and it fades away over the course of 10 days. Um, once you've located it, you can then look with even more powerful, you can look with powerful ground-based telescopes to get the spectrum of the light. You can break the light from that, um, it's called a kilonova. Um, so novas uh, 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 come from the, the new stars, so this is a kilonova, it's not a supernova of an exploding star, it's the kilonova produced when two neutron stars crash into each other. And you can use telescopes um, like the, uh, the the National Science Foundation's Gemini telescopes to take spectra of the uh, of the light. And so this picture shows over one and a half days, two and a half days, three and a half days, four and a half days, five and a half days, at different wavelengths of light. And this is kind of colored by the dominant colors in the spectrum of the light. So initially it appears bright and blue, and then it fades away, and the peak of the colors moves towards the, the from the, the high energy blue end of the rainbow towards the lower energy red end of the rainbow, until you get this kind of um, dim red glow, and you can't really see it here, but it's kind of peaking towards the red colors of the end. So it evolves from this bright blue transient down to this dim red transient, it eventually glows in, in, in x-rays afterwards. And by monitoring this, you can figure out what's going on. You can tell the nature of the neutron star collision, and believe it or not, the light that was actually created that we're watching there evolve, we can link that to the evolution of nuclear physics, and we can say that the nuclear reactions that produce that light are actually the nuclear reactions that produce the heavy R, what they're called R process elements, gold, platinum, these heavy elements that aren't created in supernova explosions, and their origin has been a mystery. They were hypothesized to be created in these neutron-rich neutron star collisions. You need lots of neutrons to make these heavy elements. You don't get enough neutrons in supernova explosions. So with these neutron star mergers, you get enough neutrons to make gold and platinum and, and other heavy elements. And so what you're seeing here is chemical alchemy. It's the creation, it's, the term, it's, it's turning these neutron stars into gold and platinum, the heavy elements that, that uh, um, that we experience on Earth. And these neutron star mergers have been happening throughout cosmic time. And so billions of years ago, one of these neutron star mergers happened somewhere in our galaxy throughout this material. It got recycled by the giant blender that is the Milky Way swirling round. And this material ended up in the cloud of gas that formed our solar system. And that's where these materials we see today come from. But you can learn a lot more um, uh, about uh, the nature of nuclear matter. So I'll turn it over to Laurel now. So Laurel, I will give you control of my screen. Um, and so Laurel's going to talk about how we use um, uh, the, uh, the neutron star mergers to, to understand how neutron stars work. Yeah, um, so my work focuses on understanding kind of what's going on uh, in the interior of a neutron star. Um, so the neutrons that are making up a neutron star are exactly the same as the ones that make up everything on Earth. If you think of an atom made up of protons, neutrons, electrons. Um, so we can study neutrons here in our labs, but what we can't understand is what happens to neutrons when they're packed as tightly together as they are inside a neutron star. Um, so to give you kind of a better visualization of how dense a neutron star is, if you were to dip a teaspoon into a neutron star and pull out just a teaspoon of that material, it would weigh uh, more than a billion tons. Uh, so that's how close everything is packed together in there. And so on the one hand, you have the gravity of all of that mass, which is pulling the star inwards, but then on the other hand, you have the pressure that the neutrons are exerting on each other, pushing it outwards. So when one neutron is pushing on another one, the other one is pushing back. And so they can only get so close together, but we're not exactly sure how close. And so with gravitational waves, we can measure the mass of the uh, neutron star and the radius. So basically figure out how much matter, uh, how many neutrons are in the star and how much space they're taking up. And so we can use that to figure out how close they are together. Uh, so basically measuring like how squishy a neutron star is. 
Um, and that can tell us a lot about astrophysics, but since it's neutrons, it's also relevant to the world around us here on Earth. Um, and so we haven't been able to do this measurement yet with the gravitational wave detectors that we currently have, but uh, we have plans in the future to build more sensitive gravitational wave detectors that will allow us to look more closely at the interiors of neutron stars. So uh, in about a decade or so, uh, the European Space Agency is going to launch a detector called LISA, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, and that's going to be like LIGO in space. And it's going to be way bigger than LIGO. And so it's going to be able to detect gravitational waves at frequencies that we've never been able to see before. But then a little further down the road, we also have plans for a bigger ground-based detector called Cosmic Explorer. So whereas LIGO has four kilometer arms like you saw in those pictures, Cosmic Explorer will have uh, 40 kilometer long arms. And that extra length will give us a lot of extra sensitivity. And so um, signals that right now are very quiet will be a lot louder in our detector. And so we'll be able to learn a lot more information from them. And we'll also be able to detect signals from a lot farther away in our universe that currently are too quiet to hear. So there's a lot of new science that we're going to be able to do with uh, both of these new detectors. Great, thanks Laurel. So, um, so Laurel's working on um, both the probing the interior of neutron stars with the uh, um, with current detectors and then with these next generation of detectors, I will turn it over to Amber now. And Amber is going to talk about not every um, uh, not every merger is as simple as I've I've described with two stars just going around each other. So I will turn it over to Amber, who will talk about her research. Um, so I I actually and looking at things that don't exist in circular orbits. So all of the previous detections that LIGO has currently made are done, um, are, are of binaries that are in circular orbits. So like this video shows, like they just go around each other and then eventually they get closer together as they make gravitational waves and then they merge. Um, but I look at things, okay. Um, so I look at things and when we talk about eccentricity, eccentricity is essentially how elliptical an object's orbit is. Um, so like this graphic shows, as the eccentricity gets higher, um, the, the orbit becomes more elliptical. So um, th these kind of uh, detections would tell us a lot about uh, the, like, uh, the formation channels of the neutron stars, which is kind of important because we want to know, or, or any black hole also, because we want to know how these objects form in our universe. Um, so I look at things like that. And um, there are things like this, this video would show um, objects interacting with each other in uh, orbits of two or three, and sometimes stars get thrown out or sometimes they um, interact with each other. And these could create objects that look at elliptical orbits. So like Laurel talked about with Cosmic Explorer, Cosmic Explorer will have the ability to do that. Currently LIGO's detectors um, are not necessarily as sensitive and uh, Current, with Cosmic Explorer, we might be able to detect um, orbits with orbits of uh, binaries that have a lot smaller eccentricities, but still enough to be appear it's appear circular. Um, but we could get a lot of really cool, interesting physics of from uh, orbits that are eccentric. Great, thanks, Amber. So, so that's basically kind of the, the the big picture of what's going on. So, we've discovered black holes, and we can now use gravitational waves to to probe the nature of black holes. We've discovered neutron stars, and uh, um, Laurel talked about how we can use gravitational waves to look inside these neutron stars and explore the nature of nuclear matter. Believe it or not, the way that the atomic nucleus behaves is something that we kind of know, but we don't really have the full theoretical picture of how atomic nuclei behave. And by studying these neutron stars out there in space, we can we can figure out how um, uh, atomic nuclei on Earth behave. And Amber talked about the formation mechanisms. We don't know how these binaries necessarily form and make binary black hole mergers. And, and, uh, and so by looking at this property called eccentricity, which is, tells us about the dynamics of the, uh, of the orbit, we can learn about how the universe creates these binaries that, that LIGO is seeing. And that tells us about the, uh, the life and death of massive stars and the, and the evolution of the universe. So I will uh, stop there and turn it back over to uh, Paul. Thank you. That was a fantastic presentation, and I'm sure uh, I'll, I'll speak for myself. But I, I learned I learned a fascinating amount. 
Um, while the questions queue in the chat, I'll start off with uh, with my own, and I'm happy to have have any of any of you um, jump in on this. But I suspect many in our audience are not not physics experts, um, and uh, and at least for myself, I often cringe when I see certain economics things presented in the press, and I wonder about how people perceive my own my own area of expertise. So I'm always curious when I when I get to talk to experts in another arena, what are the most sort of common or what are the things that are most painful for you when you see them presented in the press? Um, and if you could sort of cor correct any, you know, any sort of caricatures of your of your field, what would they be? And as a as sort of a, a tack on to that, for someone who wants to follow this research and, and follow sort of the cutting edge of physics, um, what, do, what do you suggest as a healthy healthy source for uh, research and reading? Is it is it a journal? Is it a periodical? Or is is there a uh, is there a book that that we should all have on our shelf? Um, I'm sure many of us would appreciate knowing knowing the right one to read. So let, let, let me I can I can maybe take the take the first question first question first about you know what what kind of makes me um, wince a little bit when I when I see popular popular coverage of it and I think you know that science fiction is probably the the, uh, um, the thing where where you maybe sometimes as a physicist have to just hold your breath a little bit um, and and just in, just enjoy it for what it is I think. Black holes are something that is, you know, they're a real physical object. We've we've seen them. We've we've demonstrated they exist physically. You know, we we've touched with the gravitational waves. We built the tectiles on Earth that have kind of touched the surface of a the, the event horizon of a, of a black hole. So we know they're real physical objects, and we know how they behave. They also feature a lot in movies, um, and and their their portrayal in the movies is not always necessarily the um, uh, physically correct. I think the one movie where it is physically correct is Interstellar. Um, uh, cause that, that was co-written by a, by a, 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 a prominent physicist called Kip Thorne. Um, but you know, the, the, the joke is black holes don't suck, right? So, so you don't, you're not going to get sucked into a black hole. You might fall into a black hole, but that's your own fault. The black hole is not going to suck you in. So I think that's one of the things that when, you know, when you see people, you know, struggling, you know, they're getting sucked into the black hole. That's one thing I think. So the second question on kind of following the progress of the field, um, you know, there's a lot of good popular Quantum Magazine is, a, is an online magazine published by the Simons Foundation that is very good um, uh, for, for following the, uh, the progress of the field. I don't know, Amber or, or Laurel, if you have any things that you might suggest that people, kind of popular science blogs or, or anything that you guys follow that you might suggest. I think Kip, Kip's book, Black Holes and Time Warps, is one that I recommend to people um, if, they're, if they're interested in kind of the subject of, of gravity and, and, and general relativity and gravitational waves in general. It's an, it's an old book and it's out of date in some places, but it's still a good, good uh, introduction to the field. That was great. I, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll, I'll admit, I, I tried to read Feynman's six um, not so easy things, and, and that is a grossly uh, generous title, at, at, least, at least for. Uh, at least for me. Um, but uh, now we have some questions in the queue, so I'll, I'll work my way through through those. Um, I think this uh, Jason uh, Jason Lord, who I know you're familiar with, uh, started off, started us off with uh, a question: With the larger ground-based detector, how does the size to sensitivity ratio scale? If the detector is ten times as large, will it also be ten times as sensitive? Amber, Laurel, do you guys want to take that question? Yeah, I can take this one. Um, so generally, yes, it will scale like that. Um, so the same gravitational wave that we signal that we see now will cause a 10 times bigger distortion in the distance uh, in our arms. Um, there's some more nuances that go into it in terms of like noise in the detector, and that will hopefully also be improved by the time that uh, detector is operational, but generally, yes. <laughs> Okay, um, a question from uh, MST. If the gravitational wave observatories are positioned on the ground, how are they gathering the impact of the waves? That's one of the tricks to building gravitational wave observatories. You have to, you have to fool those mirrors into thinking that they're not sat there on the ground. Um, and so, so most of the effort 
in building a gravitational wave detector goes into to isolating the mirrors that the laser beam is bouncing between as well as you can from from the from the ground so the mirrors just think they're they're freely falling in in space um so you do that with multiple layers of isolation um in the uh the, the uh the, let's see if i can uh, share my screen again so i'll show you the uh the the picture of um uh so, so, so this is a picture of, of here's one of the mirrors down here at the bottom, and and most of this equipment up here is to isolate these mirrors from the ground, like it, multiple layers of kind of like noise cancelling headphones that sense ground motion and feedback and feed it back into the mirrors, and then these are hung from multiple pendula that isolate the mirror. So, so that's the trick. You need to make the mirror think it's not connected to the ground and it's just freely hanging there in space, and then in the in the direction that the mirror is free to swing on the bottom of the pendulum, it just Moves backwards and forwards as space time gets stretched and squeezed between the uh, um, between the, uh, the 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 beam splitter and the and the mirror. Great. Uh, a question from Barry Bartlett: Does elongation suggest how early neutron stars are before colliding? Um, so the 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 quantity that determines how far back we can see. Um, uh, the the merger is the is the frequency of the gravitational waves, um, and so 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 we don't um, uh, what we think of in terms of the with with these things are far enough away that they appear as point sources on the sky. You can't resolve. It's not like you can see the elongation angle of the uh, of the of the planets in the solar system where we're close enough to resolve the dynamics of the orbit. These things are so far away, they just look like a point on the sky, and you, you don't you don't resolve the binary itself. What you're seeing is the ripples in, of curvature of space time, and so what sets the length of the gravitational wave signal is really the the rate at which those things merge into each other. So we can start seeing the gravitational waves around around a frequency of 10 hertz. Um, that's when LIGO uh, the the noise in LIGO is low enough that you can actually distinguish signals from noise, um, and you can track the gravitational waves as they sweep up from 10 hertz to a couple of kilohertz, um, which is nicely through the, the human range of human hearing, so you can hear the signals. And these black holes are short signals because they, they, they're they they traveling very quickly and they merge very quickly, but the neutron stars are longer signals because they so they take a more less massive, take a more leisurely place to, to spiral in and, and crash into each other. So that, that's how we kind of define the length of the signals by the, uh, the, the frequency and the rate at which the frequency changes. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, the following question from Luke's, uh, will a neutron star stay as a neutron star or is there a, a parameter feature that makes it transition to a black hole? Laurel, do you wanna maybe talk about the fates of, of compact object remnants if they're big enough where they collapse to stay as neutron stars or collapse down to black holes? Uh, yeah, so there's sort of a, a mass divide that separates a neutron star from a black hole. And so um, anything below, I think about two and a half uh, times the mass of our sun is uh, small enough to be a black hole. And then anything above about five solar masses, or is small enough to be a neutron star, sorry. Anything about, about five times the mass of our sun is uh, large enough to be a black hole. And then in between, uh, we're not quite sure what this happens. And that's kind of something that we're examining with LIGO. Um, but so, for example, if you have two neutron stars and they're in within that smaller neutron star limit, but you crash them together, then their mass is suddenly large enough that they can turn into a black hole. And in fact, the, the fate of that remnant is something also tells us about the nuclear equation of state, whether they uh, um, it's it's sensitive to, to the, this you know pushback you get from gravity in the, in the neutron star. The neutron star equation of state is what we call very stiff but it can push back against gravity and it won't collapse down to a black hole. But if the neutron star equation of state is soft, then gravity can pull it down and it will collapse down to a black hole. The next question is from Michael and I, uh, he just wrote a uh, quasars question mark. So I'll, 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 I'll guess what Mike is asking here. So, so quasars are um, uh, supermassive black holes very, very far away in the universe that are very bright sources of, of, uh, of of uh, electromagnetic radiation. And um, the the engines that power quasars are black holes that are of about a million times the mass of the sun. And these black holes are too massive for, for, for LIGO to see because they 
they in spiral so quickly that they crash into each other. They um, and they they generate gravitational waves at frequencies much much lower than 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 LIGO or, or Cosmic Explorer can see. Um, Laura mentioned LISA, the, the, the space-based telescope, and one of the prime targets for LISA, which looks at much lower frequency gravitational waves, is to see supermassive black holes um, orbiting around each other and crashing into each other, and so um, uh, detect the gravitational waves from, 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 uh, uh, that are caused by the supermassive black holes that power quasars. Okay. Uh, a question from David, how do you coordinate the detection of a passing uh, gravitational wave to telescopes? Are there telescopes on call to act as, uh, as a follow-up to the gravitational wave detectors? Um, yeah, so that, this was actually a big effort in the, in the astronomy community to, to get this coordination set up. So the, the field that pioneered this, this type of coordination um, was the gamma ray burst um, uh, field. So gamma ray bursts are some of the brightest electromagnetic events in the universe. Um, so when uh, when a, a certain types of star, supernova uh, stars explode in supernova, they can produce what are called long gamma ray bursts. Um, two neutron stars crashing into each other produces a, a short gamma ray burst. And gamma ray bursts were first detected by U.S. spy satellites back in the uh, in the 60s and 70s, and they thought they were detecting massive Soviet nuclear explosions. When in fact they were generate they were detecting uh, cosmological bursts of, of gamma rays from uh, um, uh, from distant galaxies. And so, so once people figured out that these were um, extragalactic sources, they set up something called the the GCN, the Gamma Ray Coordinates Network. Um, that once gamma ray detectors in space figured out where on the sky the gamma ray burst was coming from, then they could point telescopes at that region. And so, so when gravitational wave detectors came along, we kind of piggybacked on this work that the, um, uh, the, the gamma ray community had done and said, well, we have another way of localizing regions on the sky where people should go and point. And, and people signed up to receive these alerts. We sent them out through the NASA's um, uh, gamma ray coordinates network. And people who were signed up to, um, uh, to to receive these alerts could then go and point the telescopes and try and search for the, uh, the the needle in the in the ten square degree haystack of of where the gravitational wave detectors think the sources are. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, if a uh, next question from Caleb, how do you know you have detected a gravitational wave and not other noise that has not been addressed with the neutralizing features of the gravitational wave observatories? So Amber, do you want to um, have a go at answering that? Because you've been working on searches. I think that that's a good question for you. Uh, sure, I can do that. Um, so the way the gravitational waves are detected, it has to be seen by at least two detectors. Um, so And it has to happen within the light travel time between the two detectors. Um, and that confirms that it's a detection. Um, if one gravitational wave detector sees it and it's not seen in the other two, um, then it can be checked to be a glitch or just some random noise. Um, so that's usually the way that they are confirmed to detections. Okay. Um, thank you. That that's helpful. Uh, one more question from Elizabeth. Uh, what is the uh, scale for the size of the ripple, particularly as it translates to noise, like Dr. Brown shared in his presentation? Does the ripple take a long time to resolve into a definable pattern that can be identified, or a short time? So, so the size of these ripples, I, I, I should have included a, a slide that showed this to illustrate it. So the challenge of detecting gravitational waves, the reason why it took 100 years from, from the initial proposal of, of the existence of gravitational waves to actually detecting them was it, is gravitational waves are, are the ripples are tiny. Um, so I said that the, the goal of LIGO is to very accurately measure the distance between two mirrors, and as a gravitational wave goes past, it causes the mirrors to move backwards and forwards, as, as shown, you know, vastly exaggerated scales like this. The actual movement of those mirrors over the, the two and a half mile long length of the arm is smaller than the size of a proton. Um, and so the, the actual, the, the, the strain, the change in length divided by the length caused by the gravitational waves is, is absolutely tiny. Um, measuring, measuring the strains that LIGO is, is, uh, um, is sensitive to is equivalent to measuring the distance between 
uh, the sun and uh, Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to the sun, that's a distance of 4.2 light years. It's equivalent to measuring a distance of 4.2 light years to a precision that is smaller than the width of a human hair. So this is an incredibly precise measurement you need to make in order to uh, um, in order to to uh, uh, measure the uh, the gravitational waves. And you need good models of the gravitational wave signal to do that in order to pull them out. So one of the things that Amber's been working on is we have collaboration with a group in Illinois, and they model um, uh, these eccentric binary signals. They come up with models what the gravitational waves look like. And so using these models, we can dig into the detector noise and pull the signals out. And so it can take between, depending on how loud the signal is, you know, the loudest signals you can see very, you can resolve very quickly. They're very obvious, but then quieter signals might require, you know, months of careful study and patient work to dig into the noise and really separate the signal from the noise and say, yes, no, do we, do we have a real signal in there? So it can be, uh, um, it can, it can be almost instantaneous or it can take months and months and months to, to dig it out, depending on the amplitude of the signal. Hmm. Uh, the following question uh, was, what is the future of gravitational wave research? What are the next big questions researchers are hoping to tackle, especially as more sensitive equipment is built? And if I may, I'll, I'll, I'll tack on my own question here. One of the things I wonder about is, um, I guess over the last century, it, it seems like physics and, and perhaps science more generally has gone from, you know, um, the Einsteins working by themselves in a relatively isolated theoretical sense to major multi tens of billions of dollars projects. What are the challenges that come when, when these projects are done um, across this, uh, you know, across so many people and, and take so long to work out? Has, has that changed sort of, do you think that has changed the nature of, of the investigative process? I think one of the things one of the things that is true in physics, I think, and, and this comes back to your very first question, I think this is something that's maybe misunderstood in, in popular culture, is, is kind of the myth of Einstein being the lone figure who, who did this stuff without connection. He did, he was, Einstein was deeply embedded in the physics community and, and, and knew of the work of Maxwell and, and, uh, um, and uh, you know, mathematicians who helped him develop the mathematical framework for his theory. So really physics has always been about collaborating. I mean, with the, the theoretical collaboration has tended to be in smaller groups and, and, uh, um, uh, uh, than, than the big, um, experimental collaborations because the, the scale of these types of large instruments is, is much bigger and requires much more people to do it. But physics has always been a you know very kind of collaborative effort of, of people building on each other's work and bouncing ideas off each other. So Einstein was well connected to Syracuse through uh, Peter Bergman, um, who was one of his assistants who, who created the, the gravitational group here in, uh, in Syracuse. So um, the, the, the transition to kind of these big science projects like the LHC and, um, uh, and LIGO, you, you can really only kind of achieve this kind of, you know, big scale, big science with, you know, large teams of people working closely together. And, and it, you know, it, it presents different challenges, right? Sometimes it's nice to work in a group of two or three people on some particular problem. Other times, you know, you need a team of, of, of 100 people or more to, to really attack the problem. And, and in, in these big science projects, Typically, not people don't work on every aspect of the instrument. They'll have their piece of the instrument that they work on, and so I think the challenge there is is not getting kind of focused on your little piece, and you know, just taking a breather and taking the big step back and say, okay, so I work on, you know, the seismic isolation system, but it's a piece of the bigger whole, and and just keeping that kind of perspective. I think that's something that that people can lose in these big collaborations. That you feel like you don't want to feel like a cog in the machine, and you want to remember, you know, the the, the bigger perspective that you, everyone is working towards. Um, and, I, and I don't want to crowd out the person's questions on what, what do you see as the future of, of gravitational wave research? Is there a particular question that you see as the next big one? I think that the, the big questions are kind of, you know, really getting to the big questions of how did the universe evolve? How did structure in the universe evolve? Um, uh, Laurel talks about Cosmic Explorer. Cosmic Explorer will be sensitive enough to see every binary black hole merger in the universe all the way back to the beginning of time. As you look further out into the universe, you're looking further back in time. And so Lisa and Cosmic Explorer will be seeing the very first stars, um, uh, the black holes produced by the very first stars and how structure grew and, and, and how the universe itself evolved. So, so there are some really big questions we can answer. We have sensitive enough detectors. 
we can try and understand the nature of gravity. We don't know how to get quantum mechanics to play nicely with general relativity. So maybe there's some hints on how to do that in, in more sensitive experiments we can do with, with gravitational wave detectors. Oh, that's great. Jason asked a, asked a second question. If the accuracy seems to depend on making sure that the length of the arms are as close to identical as possible, how will this be done in space with LISA? Um, that's a great question, Jason. So, so LISA works on a slight, we always say LISA is LIGO in space, but that's selling LISA short. LISA works on a principle called time delay interferometry, um, where, where really it's you've got three spacecraft in a triangle, and you're timing the amount of time it's, it takes to send pulses from, from uh, um, one of these spacecraft to another spacecraft. So you don't need to worry as much about the length of the arms being the same because you're timing the, the time it takes pulses to travel between the spacecraft rather than measuring the, measuring the length of the arms precisely. There's a longer answer than that, but that, that's probably the best I can do in, in, in a couple of minutes. Miriam has a question. How much progress are scientists making in studying the universe through gravitational waves? Um, I, I would say you can judge that by the fact that we've, we, in the last five years, we've already rewritten some of the major textbooks. Um, so, so when I first started teaching Astronomy 101 in Syracuse, um, uh, you know, the, the, the undergrad astronomy textbooks basically said, you know, we, the Big Bang creates hydrogen, a bit of helium, stars then burn that to heavier elements, supernova make even heavier elements, but we don't really know where the, you know, the golden platinum come from. Now we do, right? We, we've discovered the, the origin of these heavy elements in the universe. We've seen the universe make gold. Um, uh, we've discovered now hundreds of binary uh, black hole mergers. And so by studying the demographics of these binary black hole mergers, it tells us how stars live and die and explode and the, and the remnants they produce behind. And so, so really, you know, we've done a tremendous amount already, but we're only at the beginning of, of, of the exploration of the, of the gravitational wave sky um, with, with these detectors. They've only been operating for, you know, some small fraction of the last five years or so. Hmm. David uh, asked, is there a way to discover if gravitational waves originate in particular places or time? So the particular place you get from the location on the sky from triangulation, um, the time you get from the distance, because once you get out, um, gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. And so um, as you look out into the universe, you're seeing things back in time because that light took, as you look further and further out, that light took longer and longer and longer to reach you from the source that was generated. So by measuring the distance to the event, um, you're actually measuring the uh, uh, how far back in time that event took place. So by knowing that the two binary black holes um, we saw in September 2015 is a distance of, of, uh, of, a, of a couple of gigaparsecs, we know that that translates to a couple of billion years ago. Great. So uh, we've been able to run through the questions in the queue, and I'll, I'll uh, ask one of my questions to wrap us up. I suspect one of the challenges or one of the um, so one of the nice things about this audience is, is we've all come here of our own free will and, and fruition and are, are interested in learning. And, and this talk was excellent for that. But I suspect, Duncan, you probably have to deal with people who um, I suspect, let's, let's, let's label them Congress people, um, who uh, dole out you know, a, the National Science Foundation budget and whatnot. How do you sell? Um, I mean, I, how do, you, how do you convince them? How do you show them the value of this um, when challenged against other priorities? I think we have a little bit of a built-in advantage with our project because I, I, Peter Sawson, who's one of my colleagues, um, uh, he's emeritus professor here now, he retired um, last year. He was around, Syracuse has been involved in gravitational waves since its inception, since the, the, the field really began in earnest. And, and Peter tells the stories of, of Robbie Vogt, who was one of the leaders of, of LIGO early in the days, going basically to the halls of Congress and saying, black holes, look at these, you know, we're going to detect black holes crashing into each other. And, and, and you know, people's eyes light up and say, that sounds really cool. And then you say, and by studying these black holes, we'll be able to understand the nature of gravity, how a strong matter behaves, we'll be able to advance our knowledge of physics, these techniques will have applications, the computers will develop, but we, we you know, there's a lot of what the NSF calls broader impacts from our field of, of uh, the development of one of the software projects we pioneered when I was a graduate student to do this large scale computing that we need to detect gravitational waves is now being used by a chip company called Infineon to design 
um, uh, uh, semiconductors by doing these large scale simulations. So they use the same infrastructure we used to do that. So these are kind of the industrial spin offs that the, that the field has. But I think in our field, we're lucky that we can say, um, uh, you know, black holes are cool. And, and, and even people in the halls of Congress agree with that for the most part. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Well, this has been a pleasure. And uh, I've noted down, I, I need to watch Interstellar um, as, a, as a, a more credible physics movie um, and, uh, and, and start reading uh, the Simons Foundation's Quantum. Um, but thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Brown, Amber, and uh, Laurel. This was a, a very enlightening talk. Um, but before we close off, I have uh, a closing statement. Um, the College of Arts and Sciences has two more Alumni Academy events planned this semester. Uh, Sally Cor Cornelson, professor and director of the Florence Graduate Program in Italian Renaissance Art, will be giving a talk uh, in entitled Picturing the Italian Renaissance Woman, Artists, Images, and Patrons on Friday, April 16th at 4 p.m. via Zoom. And faculty from the college's Forensic and National Security Sciences Institute will be speaking about how forensics can help understand and stay ahead of viruses mutations on Thursday, April 22nd at 4 p.m. also on Zoom. So with that, um, it's been quite a pleasure. Thank you for giving me the honor of, of hosting all of you. Um, and thank you to our audience for joining us and um, happy uh, sesquicentennial to uh, the College of Arts and Sciences.